Good afternoon. This is Sandy Hicks with the Inside Story. As you know, under our umbrella of the New Hampshire Minority Health Coalition, where we look at health and culture and education and refugee and immigrant issues and diabetes and health and a lot of areas um, of Black Scholarship Foundations under our pro and emerging leaders. So today with me, I'm fortunate enough to have with me someone from Catholic Charities who's going to uh, right, yeah. talk a little bit first about uh, an upcoming breakfast that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then we have with me also Susan Gunther. Susan Gunther and Armin Hebert. And they're both with Toastmasters, though Susan does like myself, wears a lot of hats. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about Emerging Leaders and how the Toastmasters program is a partner with us to do that kind of work. Yes. So first, why don't we hear from you, Kathy? Well, okay. I work with uh, New Hampshire Catholic Charities and uh, in the role as director of the program of Immigration and Refugee Services. I work with many, many different service agencies, uh, government representatives, private citizens, and um, we, in one meeting at some point in a while, a while ago, thought it would be a great idea if Manchester could gather and celebrate its rich, long-standing history of welcoming immigrants, particularly through uh, diverse faith communities. So uh, we stole the idea pretty much from Concord, uh, <laughs> but it's taken its own unique flavor here in Manchester. And on May 2nd, 730 to 930 at the Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, we'll be uh, celebrating our first interfaith prayer breakfast. Uh, the theme is a place at the table for everyone. I love it. Uh. And uh, that term, stole it, I don't like. I usually jump right on and say, we borrowed or mm -hmm. we've expanded the idea. <laughs> <laughs> we expanded the idea. <laughs> Being a Native American, that word stole is something that I could go off in a lot of directions about. Yes. And especially yes. as we talk about uh, casino gambling and the ch challenges that are happening in Massachusetts these days. So I, I don't like that word stolen. <laughs> so it gets used in a lot. Right. Well, and Sandy, may I jump in? and add Please to that do. Uh, because I have spent almost 30 years in working with nonprofit organizations and I always feel if somebody borrows my idea that's the highest form of praise absolutely so there you go well thank you as an attorney as an attorney I have to be careful about giving credit where credit is due so the idea yes. did you get written permission to do that <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did get the, the, the uh, blessing of others in Concord who think it's a great idea that we uh, establish this in Manchester. And yeah, I'm excited about it, and I'm hoping to be able to attend. Terrific. Uh, you, you know, transportation's an issue, and my calendar stays loaded, but that anything that has to do with faith-based things, I'm right there. Well, be our guest if I you can be, make it. I intend to try, and the other di idea of, you know, bringing us all together. I'm one that we're all God's children in this earth. As we become more global, we're mm -hmm. more and more aware of that. So when we talk about immigrants and refugees, that's a question I, uh, I think about the language that we use, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Who's an immigrant and who's a refugee? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And what are the reasons behind it? <laughs> uh, and do you want me to go into that? Please okay. do. Okay. That's okay All with right. you guys. Sure. Sure. So I just want to point out this is not um, a breakfast to celebrate immigration reform. It's not a breakfast to make in any way, shape, or form a political statement. Mm -hmm. Manchester, uh, years ago, uh, in the heyday of the mills and the Industrial Revolution, had a population of something like 54% immigrants. So okay. the, the, the history, the culture has been here, and primarily people had very strong faith, as is true today. So whether you come as an immigrant or whether you come as a refugee, in, in most cases you come with a fairly strong faith background, and, mm -hmm. and we have uh, strong ties with uh, leaders in the Hindu community, leaders in the Muslim community, uh, leaders in the Jewish community. Uh, we, we don't uh, make distinctions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are all here working on the same goals. Um, so the difference 
a refugee is an immigrant. It is just a different category of immigrants. Exactly. Immigrants come in all shapes and sizes. Um, my grandparents came to the United States from Canada, mm -hmm. not to Manchester, but in a city in Massachusetts, very similar. Um, and I grew up in a French-speaking household, so oh, this feels home to me. Mm -hmm. um, my, but but you, so people come for work. Uh, people come documented or undocumented, but typically they come for work. Um, my grandparents came undocumented. Uh, the um, uh, high-end, high-skilled uh, employers mm -hmm. seek immigrants uh, to come to work. Uh, farmers seek immigrants to come to help uh, in agricultural jobs. The construction field mm -hmm. seeks immigrants to help with some of those skilled trades. So workers come to America, but then um, there are these special categories such as refugee or an asylee who come because they're fleeing uh, usually ethnic, religious, political persecution, fear of their safety, their life, or their family's safety and life in another country. So for example, right now we have um, a number of Iraqis who have come within uh, recent years, they come through an international humanitarian program mm -hmm. that is operated by the United Nations mm -hmm. uh, in concert with countries such as America. Um, but for example, the uh, most of the Iraqis were supporting American troops in one way or another. Mm -hmm. They were known to be U.S. supporters after the invasion of Baghdad, and they fled for their safety, many of them suffering some pretty significant trauma. And so they made application for refugee status and were received. Asylees typically find their way to America and seek protection because if they were to return home. So refugees come with a status, a, a, a pathway to citizenship already mm -hmm. established. They are legitimate. They can legitimately, within a year of arrival, apply for their green card status. That might be two forget but anyway soon after arriving they can mm -hmm. apply for green cards and then move on to citizenship asylees uh, need to apply for that status once they're here and there's no guarantee it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, status to attain okay um, it's so, not automatic in other words oh absolutely <laughs> not and and particularly for asylees you can imagine if you could just come to the United States and claim some kind of persecution mm -hmm in another faraway part of the world, mm -hmm. it would be a difficult thing to prove. So when you are successful, you anyone who's a successful asylee has typically really proven well okay. they, that they are the targets. They have to come up with a lot of very detailed evidence of okay. the, the threats that were against them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And may I ask a question? <laughs> um, Please. You're the host. <laughs> no, no, that's we we have an interactive conversation. Okay. Here, and this is all for the community to okay. become aware. Well, this may be a dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, what is meant by undocumented? Okay, so um, refugees come already documented. Okay. We know who they are. Um, they have a, they have a, a little card when okay. they come in that gives them permission to come into the United States. Okay. Uh, tourists come documented uh, with a visa. Okay. Okay. A tourist visa or a student visa. Students would come. Uh -huh. So you apply beforehand and then you are given status. Okay. In a particular category, you have approval. Undocumented people will find their way into the United States okay. and um, without papers. Mm -hmm. It's not a crime to be undocumented. It's a civil violation. A lot of people think, oh, okay. they're criminals. But in fact, it's a civil violation yeah. uh, to be undocumented in the United States. And usually it's driven by severe conditions in a home country, poverty, um, and, and very similar. Uh, a lot of people flee the, the uh, threat of gangs. Okay. Um, and so mm -hmm. that that is a significant problem in, mm -hmm. in uh, Mexico and uh, Central America mm -hmm. as well. When the term illegal started to be used, mm -hmm. I immediately would get a little upset. I've seen you bristle <laughs> with that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and because I want people to learn the proper term and yeah. understand what it means. Yeah. And so that's why I like to have these 
opportunities to have people come and yeah. explain it from a legal yeah. basis and so that people really are informed yeah. because the media throws out terms and people jump right on it yeah. and they use them and it can be very offensive yeah. and um, and erroneous. Mm -hmm. Erroneous and of course it's a it's really um, well the, the church's position on this is that no human being can be illegal by virtue of their existence so mm -hmm. that's uh, one point. The other is the term alien had been used and it was used in the law for a long time but mm -hmm. that has such terrible connotations yeah. so it's it's really someone who comes without documents so why don't we just call them undocumented okay and that that's what i was trying to understand the difference between people that use the term illegal and and undocumented so thank you for right. that you're welcome all right. That's what this is about, so we all can learn something new. Um, I've had join with me a um, young Yoli. lady, Yoli, and I'll have her give a little information about herself. Yoli is part of our Emerging Leaders Program, and she'll be graduating from the, this year's program in June. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guarantee you will. <laughs> I got an inside. Yeah, there you go. You've been doing the work, and, and we've got some folks here who will testify to that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so... And Nice yes. to see you too. So, but I wanted to, to, she had joined the table. But I wanted to get back to some of the um, things that are going to be impacting our immigrant with reforms. You said there's some information. That's well, uh, a, a bill was just released by the Gang of Eight. Um, uh, it's now uh, being marked up mm -hmm. in Washington and will pass from Senate to House. And we had heard or read somewhere that perhaps by the 4th of July, before uh, people in Washington break for the, the long weekend, that uh, we would have a bill ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, it's optimistic. I hope that is the case. But there's not a given that immigration reform will happen. So those who feel supportive of reform really need to let their uh, congressional delegation know how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't take it for granted. Uh, but so there's um, a lot of what I would call practical approach to reform. Uh, the gang really did their homework, I think. Uh, yes, there are aspects that we would have preferred to have. Yes, it's a very long time, over 10 years, for mm -hmm. uh, certain people now who don't have status to become uh, citizens. But nonetheless, it really looks at, in, in a fairly comprehensive way, um, the the challenges that have faced this country. Mm -hmm. Immigration historically in the United States has been economically, politically driven. Um, if we look at the influx of Chinese mm -hmm. years ago to build our railroads, as soon as we didn't need the Chinese as much, uh, we closed down the door and, and closed the doors. Uh, so we opened for, you know, Iraqis after Baghdad or Vietnamese, uh, the children of American troops in Vietnam, yeah. the Amerasian children because of a political event. So you have this, um, this huge array of laws that have been cobbled together over years based on things that were going on at a particular point mm -hmm. in time. And it's, it's led to a lot of confusion. It's mm -hmm. led to very thick federal codes and um, it also, it really has been family-based, which is a good thing. Most of the work that we do in immigration at Catholic Charities is family-based work. But uh, employers mm -hmm. um, are very much, we're very much a part of feeding into this bill because while we've heard a lot of rhetoric about, you know, get the illegals out of here, um, American businesses rely heavily um, on the work of undocumented, whether it's construction, Locally, many projects were built around the Manchester area in recent years with the work of undocumented um, farmers. Mm -hmm. uh, when the pressure to push people out uh, came, uh, uh, agricultural workers packed up and left, and for example, in Georgia, left hor horrendous losses of crops uh, oh, on really? the backs of, oh yes, mm -hmm. on the backs of farmers. Oh yeah, oh, millions yes. of dollars of, of fruits and vegetables right. rotting. I think what happens when you live in your own little area, mm -hmm. that's all your, the world that you're yes. interested yep. in, and you don't realize the impact that how globally, mm -hmm. statewide, yep. your area-wide, region-wide, <laughs> around the country, right. these impacts are. Um, not to interrupt, but I think back to, um, 
when we were talking about green cards and, and things like that and, and young people who have come here for education. For New Hampshire, we saw a lot of diversity um, from many areas when our institutions, learning institutions, and higher invited students to come here, yes. mm -hmm. UNH yep. and New Hampshire College, the old New Hampshire College, yep. which is New Hampshire University now. And then we had a lot of small little colleges around. Well, our international programs grew. Yes. And so we would see students come for a couple of years, yep. and some would stay afterwards, yep. and some would end up bringing their families yep. and intermarry. Well, in the last 15 years, with the immigration expanding, it hasn't just been the educational communities. It's been our communities in general. Mm -hmm. And we've had families come mm -hmm. with small children. Mm -hmm. And so that's impacted our schools mm -hmm. and our neighborhoods mm -hmm. and certainly our employment areas. Mm -hmm. And so for New Hampshire, it's been an explosion in a sense. Mm -hmm. As you said earlier, we were diverse, yeah. but there were certain populations that were smaller and not as recognized. Right. And certainly as a person of color, you didn't see a whole lot. Africans are descendant people have been here since before slavery, <laughs> almost. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't a lot of information yeah, recognition. The community right. was small. Grave sites found so in I would talk and about, exactly. I mean, yeah. And, and, and coming from a Native American background, when I tell people I can trace back to 1500s, they kind of look at me and like, oh. Mm -hmm. And for many years, moving here, I moved from California. I'm from Boston, and my roots, mm -hmm. I grew up with French, Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian, all in the same neighborhood, mm -hmm. and all within the family because of the Native American yep. community. So traveling around, it was just interesting to me to see over the years. And when my husband's job moved, uh, moved us back here, rather than go to Thailand again, um, New Hampshire was ideal because mm -hmm. it was close to home. We mm -hmm. could go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, people would stop me and ask me, how was it like being up here? And I'd say, up <laughs> here from Boston? <laughs> <laughs> and the assumption was I had to have come from the South. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And do you know that those kinds of comments were made to me until a few years ago? Now, I've lived here almost 50 years. My kids have gone to school here, and my grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But the numbers were smaller then, and mm -hmm. then they increased. Yeah. And so for New Hampshire and the Manchester community, it's been just so much yeah. all of a sudden yeah. in some, many, some people's <laughs> eyes. Well, our People Fest and our uh, African Caribbean Festival, mm. which we have in the summertime, yeah. has been an opportunity for people to come out and celebrate all the heritages yeah. Yeah. and all those ethnic differences yeah. and in, in with such pride and joy. Mm -hmm. And we need that to grow. Yeah. And it creates business opportunities, too. Absolutely. When mm -hmm. we have people from different cultures coming in, they bring their ideas and expertise and culture, but they also bring a market with them. They, there are certain foods, there are certain products that they can't easily get, so that becomes a business opportunity for an entrepreneur to start a business that will satisfy those needs. And, and to that point, if I may, yes. uh, last Thursday evening at the University of New Hampshire Manchester yeah. campus, we had a, a symposium on immigration called Immigration on the Horizon. And our first speaker was Mr. Kadar Gupta, yes. who is uh, the uh, CEO at Arc Energy. Mm -hmm. And one of the points he makes so well, and I think he'd be pleased with the new immigration law because it opens up more uh, visas okay. for mm -hmm. all kinds of workers mm -hmm. at all levels. And he particularly has said that it's challenging to find some of these very specialized fields, you have to has to hire many consultants to come up with fewer people than what he could than than he could employ. But nonetheless, he said, you know, I don't understand it in America. Be in Canada, has many many more work visas. He mm -hmm. comes here, Mr. Gupta does. He creates a, an amazing company. He creates many many jobs. He's an American. His children go to American universities. Um. An, a native of India, but has mm -hmm, since mm -hmm. become a citizen. And so um, why would we not want to grow our economy through immigrants? There's this eternal fear. Yeah. And I think that's what's kept our immigration um, in a sort of retarded state because it's, it's been family-based, not job-based. Okay. But the new law 
shifts that tide a little bit. Oh, okay. It really shifts the tide. It brings allows more freedom for workers in different categories, and it even now allows certain family-based immigration, but on a merit-based system. So if you've got certain skills, if you're in uh, the United States for a while working, you might have a pathway to citizen that might take you forever or never coming through other other channels. Oh, so interesting. Um, that's why I say it, it, the bill has been thought out in many ways, that mm -hmm. it's been very responsive to a lot of the glitches. Uh, but yeah. of course, the key points is that you have to wait a long time because we need to clear up the backlog. And there's measures right. to not Rob, only so clear up the backlog, right. but also a lot of money and a lot of thought into border security. And no benefits in the family legalization end will occur until there's what they call substantial confirmation or confirmation that the border is substantially secured. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's been a lot of give and take. Right. And there's so many areas that are impacted. We have our young people in school today who now which the the issues with education mm -hmm. and, and how they're settling in and the problems they're running across. And then we've got parents who are um, struggling to find work mm -hmm. and also learning us at the same time mm -hmm. and learn the American way. Mm -hmm. And then we want to teach them skills. Yeah. So the Greater Manchester Black Scholarship Foundation, which is a scholarship opportunity for kids go wanting to enter college, is what we have every year. Okay. This is our 39th year, and we had uh, close to 100 young people ap apply from all over the state. Okay. And our applications are only for people who are entering college for the very first time. Oh, so okay. we have a selection committee that has to go through all of them, yep. and there's a criteria that they have to fulfill, like with having their this school um, transcript, SAT scores. They have to have done it of after with the SAR, and they have to write an essay and fill out our application. And that essay is very telling. And yes. you hear from that student why they think they qualify yeah. for a scholarship and what their goals are. And they write, they're able to show us if they've done some community work, mm -hmm. if they're interested, what it feels they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So we, our deadline was the 15th of April. And okay. as I said, we had over 100 apply. Unfortunately, only 78 were completed scholarships. So I spent a lot of time on the phone the last week or so mm -hmm. letting you know it's incomplete. You need to get this in. Mm -hmm. And I just picked up a bunch at the mailbox. There were postmarked. And I was telling people clearly, if it's not postmarked by the 15th, yeah. You're out a lot. Yeah. So there's a batch over there waiting for me right now. They, <laughs> and some of the schools were late sending them in. Some of the schools yeah. will send a whole bunch at one yeah. time that are incomplete. But our next step then is our Emerging Leaders Program, which is where you all come into being and we have with us Yoli. Now, the Emerging Leaders is with adults. And I was one of those people that when Martin Luther King was killed, everybody said, well, where are the leaders for the community caller? And I said, they were all over the place. They just need to be raised up. Mm -hmm. They need to be affirmed. They need to mm -hmm. develop their skills. Mm -hmm. um, leaders, we're all leaders in some way or another. Mm -hmm. um, how then you begin to feel like that? Because if we don't develop folks who are at the table, then we can't begin to make a more balanced set of decisions for the United States, That's for right. our democracy. Yeah. And part of the complaint has been, we don't have any of our folks at the table. Well, one of the things I noticed over the last decade, well, two decades in particular, as we talked about Dr. Gupta's um, educational PIs, medically wise, we've had people come here from other countries who were qualified mm -hmm. in their country, mm -hmm. and they come here, and their qualifications are not accepted here. Yes, and I've encountered that in some of my shall we call it past lives in doing uh, training I encountered one woman that it, the, 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 it's a very frustrating experience as you can tell I'm starting to sputter already mm -hmm. she had two bachelor's degrees that were not recognized in this country and so her perspective was she wasn't qualified to do any job so she was in a job retraining program and that was unfortunate she was a bright woman she was very capable she just didn't have the right piece of paper and, and I've seen some that get stuck with, with nursing or go back to being CNAs yeah. to try and work through it. Now, we think about the frustration, the financial piece of it, and the psychological piece of what mm -hmm. it says to those people who were qualified and mm -hmm. functioning, and they came here for safety and opportunity. Yes. So, as I said, with the Black Scholarship, we only do it first time entering. We're, it's in all the high schools. It's online. And we accept... Um, 
students who are homeschooled. Okay. And this is the first year I've got an application from the new charter schools. Oh, so that's great. going to be exciting. I haven't yeah. had a chance to read them all. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm just about blind, and fortunately, there's a committee that does all that. But I wanted to move on now mm -hmm. and get a little more background and information from Yoli, and who is here as um, going to be a graduate from this year's class from Emerging Leaders and Communities of Color. And Loli, Yoli, if you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience. It's really. Um, great to be here today and all the topics that you were talking about are very related to myself. Mm -hmm. I'm an immigrant myself. I'm Cuban. I was illegal once. I was living in Jamaica for five years and I chose to stay there without any documents. So it was hard but it was a great experience at the same time. So at some point I chose to come to the United States because I had a friend that told me that things will be better for me here. It wasn't at the beginning, but I'm glad to be here right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. We're so glad, glad you're here, here too. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bachelor myself from my own country, which is now valid here. Uh -huh. I'm going to Springfield College at this moment for my bachelor's in human services. Mm. I got my GED here because at the point I was looking for a job, I didn't have any qualification. Although I went to school my whole life in Cuba, because mm. that's what I like to do, and it's free. Mm -hmm. So you can get advantage of that. So when I reached here and that I was looking for a job, nothing in my resume matched whatever they were asking for. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I have from my side was languages. I speak mm. Engl English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Mm. Oh. But I'm glad to know that. <laughs> <laughs> We're often in so going to write your name But I felt that I, I need to put more on my resume. Yeah. So I start attending the ESOL classes mm -hmm. at National Adult Learning Center. Then when I finished, I didn't have a job at that time. So I went through my GED. I got my GED. And then I continue going to that um, other learning center for my get ready for college. Mm -hmm. So I got, I, I got my exam for get ready for college. I didn't start college at that time because I got a job. Mm -hmm. So I was working in a factory for two months and I got another job uh, as a receptionist in a rehab and alcohol center in Nashua. It's Keystone Hall. Okay. So I started working there. I was in that position for over a year. Then I was promoted to the um, bilingual client advocate position. Mm -hmm. I was there for a year too, and I was recently promoted. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm currently the new um, admission coordinator at Keystone Hall. It's a hard job. Whoever goes to Keystone Hall that um, goes for a to visit the, the facility, yeah. my boss said to them, she does the, the nasty job. Because <laughs> I have to be dealing with phone calls, I have to make sure that the applications are well complete, and then I have to review and I have to give the back call, you're not allowed to be here, this is not the right facility for you. Mm. And I also get calls from people that are angry, that need the treatment at that time. So it's hard, but it's a good job, I yeah. love it. Yeah. Um, I enroll in college last September. Mm -hmm. I just finished my second semester. I finished with three eights. Good for you. Three point eight. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should be dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at the time that I enrolled for college, I started the ELCC. That was also at the end of September, beginning of October. And it came on the right time because I'm the kind of person that if you don't bother me, you won't know about me. <laughs> and as you say in the last class, the biggest fear is to speak in public. 
my gosh. I can't believe I'm doing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this so well. <laughs> 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 I can't believe I'm doing this right now. I wouldn't die first. Before yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got the and biggest grin on my face when you called and said, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I maybe I got you out of your comfort zone enough <laughs> to show yeah. up. So that yeah. good. I have to thank that to the ELCC. Because I, I knew that I have probably the qualifications for that. I have the, the, the skills for that. But I have to master that. Mm -hmm. And I have to send the ELCC and the speech, a speech crafter too. I learned from there many, many things. Um, I used to talk because I want to learn the American way to, of talking. And most American talk. Um, and they say, um, oh, <laughs> and I learned like. that. <laughs> I learned yeah. like. that. And I also learned after the speech crafter went there, I also learned to cut that off from my speech. I don't know if I'm doing that well, but I'm, I'm still trying hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so important as we interact and communicate with people that we learn to take those little pieces out so that we can get our message across. Right. Yeah. There are times mm -hmm. when you want to pause when mm -hmm. you're speaking, mm -hmm. but you don't want people to lear lose the train yeah. of conversation. Um, I was raised in a household where we couldn't use any words unless we knew how to spell it backwards and forwards and what it meant. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> we, were, we were readers. Um, my, my mother on my mother's side is Native American mm -hmm. uh, with some Portuguese and fence back there. And on my father's side, there's Caucasian and African American. And my grandmother, my father's mother, raised two sets of family. Um, her both her husbands died. And so education was the thing. Mm -hmm. And she was a no-nonsense woman, had her own business. and. That was it. There was just no getting around it. So um, I got in trouble once in the fourth grade for passing a note, <laughs> and it had some choice words in it. Uh-oh. And uh, the teacher, because we were also raised, your children went to school. There was a partnership between you, your parents yeah. and the teachers. Mm -hmm. And so before I got home from school, my parents sort of knew about this. And um, never had a raised voice. It was, I understand, now you're learning how to pass notes. <laughs> and you share information with other people that you don't even know. And of course, I'm sputtering. Yes. And then the fact of the information in the note was ho most embarrassing and not language that I would ever use or understood. <laughs> so when I was questioned about certain words, I was at a loss. I think my parents went off afterwards were in hysteric. Probably. <laughs> you know, I had Probably. a great time about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. but um, I learned then I don't pass on anything. We were always taught know something because you know it. You've gone in and checked it out, not because someone told you. Yeah. And so that you're not r passing on misinformation, which is why I have trouble with the media today. <laughs> they, they rush to be out there to sensationalize, yeah. and then they have to correct, but they aren't the next story. Yeah. So uh, it was just a way of life. So and reading was a big thing, and you had to be able to, you know, hold a conversation yeah. and understand what you were reading and read all kinds of things. And because my mother liked opera Saturdays, we listened to arias in Italy, Italian, and okay. other languages. Okay. And then in our community, there was, as I said, Irish, French, Portuguese, and um, Italian that mm -hmm. was uh, spoken, and I probably mentioned that before. And in that background, we had Portuguese and French and Spanish. So I grew up with that. And then I went to school, girls Latin school, and had a, a Latin background. Um, mm -hmm. Latin. So um, it was interesting when my husband, who I grew up with, their families close by, he, he took German. And I remember thinking, what an angry, angry language, yes. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and then how do you spell things and pronounce them? So I'm very, very careful about asking people when I see all those letters, <laughs> how do you pronounce your name and how would you like to be called? <laughs> but those are things I grew up with. And mm -hmm. as we traveled around the country, I found it very, very helpful to be able to communicate more comfortably with people being able to do that. Mm -hmm. So for you, I can see your journey. You know, when people come in, you keep trying, and then you get more and more hesitant because if I say the right thing, or are they going to understand me, or, you know, mm -hmm. did I get my message across? Did mm -hmm. I lose them, you know, in the conversation? Mm -hmm. So one of the things about the ELCC program when we were developing it was we wanted to look at what things would be needed to help our young people and people in general be able to feel their sense of leadership and power. Mm -hmm. And not everybody is going to be in front of a crowd. But some people get designated by, as a leader without even intending. Mm -hmm. You know, peop other people see that in them. Mm 
And so how do we help those people really hone those skills? Mm -hmm. So that's how we sort of developed the ELCC program, which brings Toastmasters <laughs> into it. And so we said, well, we'll, we'll designate part of the year yeah is an opportunity for them to have the masters come in who are always working on it, <laughs> you know, to come in and work with our class participants. And so that's where Yoli got a chance to meet you guys. And it's exciting because from January through May, we have this session once a month where they spend the morning with the class and they have homework mm -hmm. and they learn how then to critique each other. Mm -hmm. They're invited to Toastmasters and I'll turn it over to you now to share a little bit more about it. Okay. And then you can talk about some of the other things you do that have helped with our program at ELCC. Oh, thank you, okay. Uh, well, I'd like to start to talk a little bit about Speechcraft in itself. It's a public education or a public speaking program that helps the ELCC participants uh, develop their speaking skills. But it does more than that, as you were saying, Sandy, because they start at, the participants start out uh, by answering questions. And the purpose of that, the table topics, is really just to be able to talk for a minute and make sense. And, and some of us are started that we were so shy that you couldn't stand up in front of a group of people <laughs> and make sense for an entire minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was the one of the first exercises. And then uh, the next the expansion was for you to do a speech. So you had to the participants had to learn how to organize a speech and some of the the skills that were involved in that. And then the third piece, and this is really the piece I wanted to, to focus on, is evaluation because it's really hard to, I, I have trouble with the word critique, but to evaluate someone, uh, and we do that every day. If you are a supervisor on the job, you have to evaluate your employees. You uh, are always, and you're evaluating even in family situations. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that without demoralizing people? And I think that's a huge lesson. And, and what I'd like to think of is you're offering suggestions to strengthen the message. And I just have to say, I've watched you with joy for the last several <laughs> months. It has been so much fun to watch you develop as a speaker, along with the rest of the people in your class. But the Speechcraft program is part of Toastmasters, which has really two paths. One is communication, and one is leadership. And I'll let you jump in anytime you'd like, Armin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just really allows people within the program to have a voice. And, you know, I get was... Uh, honored enough to give the last speech from one of us. We, one of our members speaks every week. And it was about trying to inspire everybody in that class that now that they have some skills, they can go out and make some changes within their community. They can go out and maybe make some changes throughout the world from wherever they've immigrated mm -hmm. from or wherever to help people wherever they need to. Or it could be just within their, their faith-based um, organization, you know, going out and talking about what you know, um, Catholic charities are doing in the community, all these different things. So these skills need to happen no matter who's out there, whether they be uh, leaders of color or anybody. These are, you know, one thing I always use when I do um, speeches and stuff is that 85% of success are people skills. 15% mm -hmm. are hard skills, meaning education and those type of things. And I believe that part of those people skills, probably 80% of it is be able to speak in public and get your point across in a way that is diplomatic and people want to hear it. You know, diplomacy is um, defined as the act of allowing someone to have your way. <laughs> I mean, and if you can do that, you can, you know, do that in a, in a nice way and really get people to come along with you, mm -hmm. or at least agree to disagree. Yeah. And uh, we were actually talking, I'm sorry, before um, the program started about uh, length of, of time in Toastmasters. And I said that, you know, basically anybody can join Toastmasters to improve their communication and leadership skills. Some of us come for a period of time, to have, we have goals set that we want to improve our communication skills. When we finish that, then we're fine, we move on. And then there are some of us like me, I'm a lifer. <laughs> 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 I have been around Toastmasters for pretty close to 20 years, and I'm always learning from that, even though it's not always part of one of the manuals that we have to work with, like you had the Speechcraft manual, mm -hmm. Yoli, to work with. Uh, but it's uh, we always learn. And one of the things that I 
find with again with working with ELCC and Speechcraft and Toastmasters I learn more than people learn from me. I think that's the thing people don't realize that um, as one who's been a professional volunteer unpaid uh -huh. for so many years <laughs> that I get so much from interacting with people but I came from a big family and I have certain people skills that are just in the DNA and I but I, it's been able to allow me to sit at so many tables yeah, yeah. but I learn so much yeah. and I get opportunities to meet so many wonderful people when you talk about that you have a colleague Yes. Francis Ajari, oh, who boy. came through ELCC. Oh, that's right, yes. He graduated through ELCC. Yeah. He became a board member of the New, New Hampshire Minority Health Coalition, and he's at Catholic Charities. That's your yeah. colleague. <laughs> right. He is my colleague, and um, I didn't get a release from him to talk about <laughs> him today. Well, but you'll have but to I'm take it up with okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. He's well, very respectful of the old lady. Yeah, yes. don't want to mess with Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are really blessed at Catholic Charities, not only to have Francis, but other colleagues from all over the world. Uh, we have a, uh, a woman who's a legal advocate from Colombia. We have a, a woman who came as a refugee mm -hmm. from Vietnam many, many years ago. Uh, and... Uh, we have American mm -hmm. attorneys as mm -hmm. well. Um, yes, but Francis is just a delight. I've enjoyed watching him grow. I learned so much from him because he knows far more about immigration law than I do. Uh, we co-teach at the uh, University of New Hampshire Law School. We run mm -hmm. an immigration clinic there, but okay. Francis does the bulk of the mm -hmm. direct guidance supervision mm -hmm. of the students, but he is passionate. He is absolutely passionate, and he, um, is in court, he's doing cases, he's on the phone, he'll, he presented at the symposium last week. He was one who came here and uh, from Canada. Mm -hmm. um, he, his, um, I believe his wife was an American, says, I, I don't know, but mm -hmm. in any case, she was originally from Ghana, but they immigrated here his, to Canada and then to the United States. Um, and and uh, he, got his law degree. Mm -hmm. He got an um, undergraduate degree in molecular biology. Um, so a brilliant young man, mm -hmm. and we're so lucky to have someone mm -hmm. like Francis. And uh, when I was in Africa recently in Kenya, just returned a few weeks ago on a, on a vacation um, with my daughter, I saw Africans' love of motorcycles, and now I understand why Francis <laughs> much prefers to ride his motorcycle. Yes. I did not know that. He is in real, oh, okay. time's yes. not showing. He'd be, so that was in my car. I'm on my motorcycle right now. <laughs> or he'd come to a meeting dressed in his outfit. And yeah. I actually know he was then his professional attire. And it was like, mm, like a Superman going into the, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Takes yeah, off and he yeah. is yeah. a riding shop student. young man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're going to be getting your degree in what? My degree is in human services. In human services. Okay. And you're at Springfield College now, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah. So it's exciting. Yeah. But yeah. part of our program also, we touch on so many different areas. And so Sue comes in and she shares in um, with her skill to um, communicate <laughs> so many other areas to our class. So uh, why don't you talk you. a little bit about some of the other areas in which you come in to ELCC to oh, some of our sessions. thank you, session. Sandy. Uh, ELCC is one of that. Like you, I do a lot of uh, volunteering, and that's one of my loves and one of my volunteer organizations. Uh, but in my day job, I do strategic planning and group facilitation and training and that sort of thing. And uh, about two months ago, I think it was now, we were able to kind of marry the two together, which was absolutely wonderful. I was able to facilitate a workshop about what is strategic planning for the ELCC participants. One of the things that I do when I do those workshops is uh, I, I don't like to lecture people. I like to have that interactive experience. And I think a big piece of it, particularly with an organization like Emerging Leaders in Communities of Color is we all have different understandings of the same words. And a lot of times when we can act through, and I don't mean act out or role play or anything like that, but when we can act through a process, we tend to understand it a bit better. And I have to just maybe brag a little bit, but one of my favorite exercises, and Yuli, I'd like to hear from you about this as well, but one of my favorite exercises was as we were doing some brainstorming around the different areas of how ELCC could grow, we of course used the flip charts and made our lists and that sort of thing, but I made each participant 
take one of the topics and facilitate a little mini discussion because you're going to have to do that in work and in school. So I thought this was a great place as kind of the learning laboratory to really practice those facilitation skills. So that was a big piece of, yeah. of what I did there. It was there. a small comfortable place where mm -hmm. you had to be a leader for a few minutes and you have to leave the other um, participants in the group to brainstorm about it was a strategy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I remember strategy. I, be, I believe that was mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one that I had. So what they believe was a strategy related to yeah. ELCC. Yeah. So they have to brainstorm and I as a leader, I have to write down whatever they say. But that was a good strategy of learning yeah. how to facilitate a okay. class. Because it was a small, comfortable group yeah. with people that you already know. Yeah. And it, it was a good experience. It really was a good experience. It I made think you feel comfortable. Right. And the piece yeah. about writing it down is interesting because, as you said, people would put out their idea and you would write it down. Yeah. And then someone else would put out an idea yeah. and you would write it down. And then in reviewing them, you'd see the similarities. Yeah. It was Similar all in yes. how people mm -hmm. presented it mm -hmm. or thought about yeah. it. And that's where you say the different linguistic or cultural yeah. differences. Yeah. Then we begin to marry them and say, oh, we're all talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we did one uh, where we talked about the, uh, the mission of Emerging Leaders and Communities of Color was written several years ago because yes. when the organization started. So one of my questions was, is that still valid? Is that mission still valid? You know, has the world changed? Has our population changed? But what I thought was really interesting is after we had comments recorded on the flip charts, there was a lot of wordsmithing going on of people negotiating <laughs> with, you know, a particular word. Should we say this? Or should we say that? Or what maybe message this do word? we want to send <laughs> exactly. out? Here exactly. <laughs> exactly. I want to, if I may, just uh, put in a plug as we go forward. We, I'm here, and, and Armin's here for both for Toastmasters and Emerging Leaders. Um, for people that are going through the uh, ELCC program, the leadership program, or uh, for your audience, Toastmasters is a great organization, and I forgot to say this a minute ago, so I have to backtrack a little bit. Uh, but if anybody's interested, there are six clubs in the Manchester area, and if people would go to toastmasters.org, you can find a club in your local community. Toastmasters is an, a worldwide organization. It's truly international. In fact, the district that we belong in is um, three pro provinces of Canada and three states. So it truly is an international district even. But it's a really rich experience. And I would encourage people to at least look at the website, toastmasters.org. That's my commercial. <laughs> very, very good, very good. Uh, interesting that we talked about the mission as being the, the task that mm -hmm. day. <clears throat> because I tried to advise, and I've sat on a lot of boards, that periodically people need to go back and look at their mission right. to find out if, right. in fact, their mission is still appropriate for mm -hmm. what they want to do at that time or where they're at. Yeah. And that's where timelines and five-year plans and all those pieces come into play. Because you look and say, where are we at with this? Have we really addressed this? Is really part, yeah. and I think with uh, technology and the way things are happening today, so much fast with media stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know your class is working on a media piece, mm -hmm. which hopefully they'll be presenting it for me. <clears throat> that you have to stop and think of how are we presenting yeah. to the community mm -hmm. yeah. who we are, what yeah. we're about, what we're trying to do, yeah. uh, what resources we have, how to be in touch with us. Mm -hmm. And those are things that, when you look at your mission, is there something in there that allows us to do that mm -hmm. and shape it so it, it's current? And I have to steal from my husband. Uh, and I've mentioned this several times. Stealing? Uh, I'm sorry, borrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 but one of the things in, in uh, conversations that John and I have had over the years, he, he mentions with the railroads and how they've struggled throughout this country to be successful and uh, financially viable. But he said, you know, it, a lot of times they looked at their industry as they were in the railroad business when in reality they were in the transportation business. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do with any, whether it's a for-profit business or whether it's a not-for-profit organization, we often need to ask that question, are we still valid? 
do, are, are we pigeonholed and this is our industry when maybe we need to broaden what the, the social issues that we're trying to address or the product we're trying to provide. And that's exactly what you were talking about in terms of social media and that sort of thing that, that we're experiencing today. Yeah, when I when someone asks me, I I let people know I'm I'm without transportation except for my feet, which God mm. gave me and legs, and my walker, mm -hmm. which is my Rolls Royce. There you go. Um, but other than that, I have to consider buses, which I ride the public yeah. transportation, and I really hold them accountable to make sure Good. handicapped people can get off and ADA person for forty years, <clears throat> and trains mm -hmm. and planes, mm -hmm. and also as you said, people talk about the rails. Mm -hmm. Well. Are we talking about freight rails? Are we talking about passenger rails? Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. buses, mm -hmm. you know, and we have a lot of buses now that are certainly getting from place to place, but they're two bu tour buses. Mm -hmm. There's rental of buses for special occasions. Then we have taxis yeah. and cabs, depending on where you are and how you call it. Yeah. And so that's all the language stuff that mm -hmm. it is important. I find as we have the people in the community trying to ride the bus, mm -hmm and have to use a ticket or try to figure out how much money. It's just interesting how often people are impatient with them, um, like they're supposed to understand and know. Mm -hmm. And I want to take that person and drop them in another country real uh -huh. fast. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm not good about that. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, before we begin to close up, which we'll be doing in a few minutes, I wanted to go back to this breakfast, which is, I'm so excited about. Um, I'm a Baha'i. I started out with very strong Christian mm -hmm. rights, and by my family being so diverse, I grew up with the exposure to all the religions, and ultimately um, became a Baha'i later in life. And because uh, we're all, we're about the oneness of mankind, and so anytime there's an opportunity for faith-based groups to come together mm -hmm. and and really recognize that there is only one God or being that you believe in. And, and then rec recognize and celebrate, you know, where we're at, where we're going, and that that needs to be the foundation of how we function. And it's like when people go off in these different directions. And I think as our communities um, have changed mm -hmm. because of the amount of diversity we have, cultural mm -hmm. and, and uh, linguistic and racial, mm -hmm. that people need to come back to recognizing that, that we all worship in different ways mm -hmm. at different times. And when there is an opportunity for us to come together and share that bounty, uh, I think people need to come out and acknowledge it. And that's why I was so excited about hearing Plus, this. Plus, I could just add one also. Our co-sponsor is uh, Welcoming New Hampshire, which is a small group of uh, advocates for simply doing that showing the side of us that welcomes mm -hmm. our neighbors, mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. that we um, are a community, are a state of communities where we rely on each other and that makes us strong in that. So welcoming New Hampshire as well. Um, surprising to us, we're filling up very quickly and tomorrow's the last day for registration. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I put something in good, there. Good, I'll I check. Maybe, I just yes. think I might have just noted that good. transportation was the only issue for me. Well, we may be able to help you with that. I'm sure I'll probably find someone. <laughs> I don't skate well anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I am just so pleased that you all were able to come and have this discussion with us and share with our listening audience uh -huh. because I think it was very informative. And if anybody has email addresses or phone numbers that they could share with people if people wanted to follow through and get more information, go for it. Certainly. Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Uh, well, for the uh, interfaith prayer breakfast next week, if for registration, it would be to uh, Nancy Bunker, my assistant, nbunker at nh-cc.org. Okay. And ours would be um, for Toastmasters. It's toastmasters.org. And there's a link there where you can uh, send an email uh, asking for information or you could also Google like Manchester Toastmasters and you'll see the clubs or Concord Toastmasters which happens to be the club that Armin and I are involved with. Mm -hmm. That's how you get all the Toastmasters. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Armin, when you're not a Toastmaster, what <laughs> else are you doing? We I, know a little bit more about I so. am a business coach consultant. Um, I do Primarily my focus is on um, businesses and leaders understanding behavior styles. 
meaning how you deliver your message, how to recognize a person or employee's behavior style, so that you can deliver. It's not always the message, it's how it's delivered, mm -hmm. and make sure that um, people understand each other and become more team-focused. So by understanding what everybody brings to the table, we can have a more harmonious um, interaction and be more productive in business and have a better image in the public. Good. Great. Well, Yoli, I'm going to close with you in a minute. Um, how was your experience first time out? <laughs> I can. I'm a speechless. <laughs> and that's not fair being a speech crafter. <laughs> I have to say thank you for this opportunity and also for the opportunity to be part of the ELCC um, classroom from this year. Okay. I'm very thankful for that. Well, the class will be graduating early June, and yeah. you have a project that you have to fill we'll for that. graduation. And then our new class will be um, the applications and opportunities. People can always apply mm -hmm. and put an application. We'll begin to look at those and sort them out end of August so that by September we'll have a new class organized and begin our sessions and we have a email address and we're on Facebook and we have a face page all this new <laughs> electronic social stuff media. social yeah. media <laughs> I'm the blind lady and I'm telling you you can't be without a computer or the cell phone and I said my cell phone was only supposed to be for emergency and I can't believe oh, the yeah. calls that come through yeah. you know where are you in this need to be instantly on you know someone yeah. wants you available yeah. at the moment and um, to respond to that but I have to remember it's all about us making choices and still staying in control <laughs> that's right well, thanks again, and we're going to wrap up. Until next time, this is Sandy Hicks with the Inside Story.